another weekly market insight where we try to sift through the noise to get to the signal to give you actual advice so you can make informed decisions. Joining me today, uh, as usual, is Chris. Uh, how is how, how's everything Happy going for here. you? Things are good. Did you stay up nope. late and watch any of the elections last night? Uh, not not really. No. No, it, no. it just it doesn't have the same feel as a presidential election. Not we probably don't even no. stay up for those either, do you? <laughs> uh, normally we cover this uh, slide at the end of the quarter or the beginning of the next quarter, but I did want to uh, point out that we had populism continues to grow as a political power. And I think that was, uh, we have a close race in New Jersey, several areas mm -hmm. in New York that have historically always gone Democrat, went Republican. We have the Virginia uh, governor race. There's also been several uh, special elections held over where in, in Texas where very strong Democratic counties have gone Republican. So I think that call uh, is, uh, is accurate. And why am I bringing it up? It's because uh, the, uh, the, the infrastructure bill is up there. It's been a refutation of a lot of the things that uh, the, the Democrats have been pushing. We're probably going to see a slowdown in that, but we'll get that into that. Uh, later in the, in the talk. Uh, supply chains continue to be a headline and uh, continue to see disruption. This is a, a slide from Bloomberg and we can see we have not had this much of a constraint in the supply right. chain. What, what the numbers are showing is when it's a positive number there's a shortage. Right, there's right? And you spend a lot more time in that surplus underneath the, the main zero line, right? Right, and we're a little bit off of the high, probably just noise, uh, but uh, you know maybe it's some uh, it's indicative of a change. Let's hope there's a change. But when we're looking at the heat map here, where it's indicating shortages, it's a cross thing. And one of the things with the supply chain is if you need a part, let's say you needed semiconductors to make trucks so that you could relieve some of the pressure, all of those things continue to feed on themselves. And, and uh, every part of the supply chain here in this um, uh, graph is indicating that there are deficits. So supply deliveries, backlog of orders, if we get into manufacturing backlog of, uh, of orders because it's difficult to manufacture if you don't, don't have all the supplies there. The labor market, uh, there is it, certainly tight. Uh, it was tight between 2018 and 2020. Uh, then we had the, the COVID uh, correction, but it's now tight again. Retail, that inventory to sales ratios. How much inventory do you have on the shelves versus the sales? That's also indicating some warning as well as commodities or raw industrial coverage. Uh, and then what is actually being impacted from the U.S.? And this graph is showing us what is uh, made domestically, what is brought in from mainland China, and what is the rest of the world. And we can see the biggest impact is textiles. Uh, so there just uh, isn't as many textiles made domestically. We get a decent amount from the rest of the world, but you can see mainland China has a, uh, an outsized portion of those imports. Same with basic materials, electrical equipment, uh, and this is mainland uh, China. I was thinking it's, uh, chips, but those are usually off uh, in uh, Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan. Uh, motor vehicles, computers, electronics. So these top areas are going to be more impacted by the, uh, the supply chain disruption, at least those that are coming in on the ocean. Obviously, there are some contingencies and, uh, and as it kind of rolls through, some things that are made uh, domestically but require parts for the machinery, et cetera, whatever, there, there are delays across uh, Many of the, the sectors. Go ahead. Do you, do you think it stays like this long term? Or you I think don't we learn from it. Move move. Well, it won't back stay like this long term for sure. And I think that uh, there will be changes. I think one, our relationship with China versus ten years ago is very antagonistic at this point. Um, there are labor shortages in, in China. There's rising prices. Uh, th their economy is not what it was ten years ago. Uh, and if we look around, we, we go just to our southern border and we look at Mexico, and if we look at the population, it's a very young country uh, and it, its population is growing. Supply chain disruptions, which you got to think Six Sigma is not going to be as cool and hot to follow uh, after this experience. So they're going to be looking for more robust supply chains and being able to just ship it uh, via truck across the border is probably more attractive. So I do expect supply chains to uh, to begin to take in consideration that long, complex uh, supply chains are probably not as good to have and just in time uh, it is not, doesn't always work whenever it's not in time, right? And then this is just showing if anyone is 
going into the retail stores, uh, many people, I don't think I've stepped in in a long time since, yeah. since really COVID, uh, because it's shipped and all the other deliveries as well as Amazon, uh, there's really not a big need to walk into them. Uh, but the, uh, the shelves are certainly showing that inventory reduction that we were talking about on that previous slide. And then I saw a very interesting uh, uh, way to visualize just how big of a problem the supply chain disruption is. Uh, and that is, if you take the 70 ships that are waiting outside of port, waiting to anchor in port to offload, and you took every one of their shipping containers or 20 foot equivalent units and stacked them end to end, they would go from Southern California all the way to Chicago. Wow. Imagine if you, that was one of our interstates, it's just like end to end, uh, there are, are, are uh, these uh, 20 foot containers. It takes a lot of trucks to move. Right. So there's a lot of goods that are just sitting yeah. off. We, we talked about coast. those ships a, a few weeks ago and that's, that's still happening. They're still not able to get you know, anchored and start unloading. Well, there, there has been some I think more of political posturing where uh, uh, Governor DeSantis has said, hey, come down to Florida <laughs> ports. I don't know how well that that would work. You'd have to go uh, through the Panama Canal, add shipping time. But uh, if, if it does uh, continue, I would think many, many ships would start routing to other ports. It's just very convenient with a lot of stuff coming from Asia to go into California. Uh, so... Um, that one of the solutions, and I was surprised that this has not been implemented yet and that we weren't doing this before, is a 24-7 port uh, where it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That certainly would be helpful for the availability of unloading it, but that's probably not the problem. Just opening them up 24-7 isn't going to relieve, uh, relieve the congestion. A lot of it has more to do with uh, trucking labor as well as the trucking chassis uh, and it's not just going to be a, a quick switch uh, there there isn't enough uh, uh, truckers that are out there uh, they can run 14 hours a day legally with some uh, with some breaks well they can't run 24 7 they have to be doing 24 hours and then there's RFID requirements for these trucks. There are specific trucks that can do it. There's all kinds of chassis that are specific that we don't have a lot of. Uh, then uh, there's also special licensing. And then there's the way that it's being compensated. So if you're a Teamster, you're paid hourly, two to three times the length of time waiting in a line uh, to get your container is not upsetting to the Teamster drivers. They're getting, they're getting paid to sit there. But if you're an owner operator and most of the business right. is owner operator, you're going to get paid a flat fee. And if it's taking you two to three times, that means you've just lost a third of your uh, or two thirds of your salary trying to wait in line. Not going to really go there. Uh, so th there's a problem with getting these trucks and the labor to these containers to get them empty. And it's, it's really going to be solved by price, which would just be to increase the price. And all of a sudden you have a lot of owner operators coming on. And then there's just the competition for the labor force. Housing market's uh, pretty high. Often truckers and carpenters, right. same pool of people that they're, uh, uh, they're, they're going from. Much rather work locally and not be on the road. Right, yeah. and then Amazon and many of the other deliveries from shipped and all the others, they're driving, they're driving locally, they can be at home at night, uh, and, and they're making good money as well, especially if you factor in the amount of time if you're an owner operator. Uh, trying to get that. So I, I think that we should be at a 24-7 port. I don't think that that's going to make a meaningful impact in the short term uh, regarding that. And then so it's just a long, slow process. It to, is going to be a long, slow process. Um, I would say the trucking industry is ripe for a disruption. You start getting some AI, some uh, kind of the uberfication of, yeah. of that area is probably what is going to solve this. Uh, and then it's not just getting the goods here, it's manufacturing them. Uh, China being the, the, the factory of the world uh, continues to see a, a contraction of its manufacturing. So once we get the goods there, we're still going to have a, a limited supply of goods being created to continue to fill uh, the, the ports and ultimately the stores. So uh, all of these are problematic. If uh, Going back to that Bloomberg article, if we go there and just say, well, what if these supply constraints remain uh, as they are right now, we're looking at uh, a forecast inflation of above 5%, uh, so pretty much what we've been experiencing, not transitory, uh, so it continues to prolong. And then even if we were to get all of this solved, the consensus forecast is still above 2%, uh, and remember, 
the Fed's target is average 2%. So we'd actually be above uh, the Fed's target. Uh, gets us to a recent report yeah. from Ackman. Yeah. And Ackman is a, a hedge fund manager. Uh, he, he, he makes frequent uh, appearances in, in media, uh, but also the Fed talks to him. Yeah, he's on the advisory panel with uh, a couple other big hedge fund managers too, Ray Dalio and Paul Tudor Jones. And the Fed meets regularly with these people all across the economy too. And the next couple slides are actually from a presentation he gave to the New York Fed a couple weeks ago. And really all summarized around a couple things. He's saying, yeah, we had 25 million lost jobs last year. We've got 20 million of them back. And those next 5 million are unlikely to be solved with monetary policy. So he's saying with unemployment this low and inflation this high, he's really calling on the Fed to start tightening sooner than expected. And the next slide really shows a, a historical tightening schedule from the last five tightening from 1987 to 2015. And both of those numbers are below the average or above. So we have inflation above the historical average when they started tightening. And we have unemployment below the average when they also started tightening. So as a summary, is uh, both these two components of the Fed looks like every other time, uh, or at least average, uh, yeah. whenever we saw these, they were raising rates. So they're probably behind the curve uh, mm -hmm. already. And Ackman is saying that they, they need to raise rates. They do listen to them. Chris, did you get your invite to the meeting? I did not. Not quite on the board with uh, no, you're not Jones on, well, and Dalio yet. I, I think you should yet. be. Uh, but, uh, so that, so, and I, I would agree with Ackman that the Fed is mm -hmm. behind the curve here. They should have been raising rates through this. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they continued to say, and I don't see the word as often as it used to be, transitory, transitory, transitory. I think they're a little concerned and certain to, to notice that inflation is probably here for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of volatility in the bond market leading up to really the FOMC right. meeting today. And we do talk about the VIX a lot, just implied volatility on the S&P 500, so equities. We rarely talk about the measure shown here, which is the move index, just implied volatility on treasuries, on, on rates. And what we can see is big shot up lately. Rates have been very volatile, and equities have not been. That's a volatility in treasuries that's not seen in equities. Right. Something has to really change here. If something comes down, either equity volatility goes up or we see a decrease in rates. Yeah, and I would say the VIX and the move is really just kind of that fear index. So right. whenever it's moving up, it's saying that the market is fearful of some type of uh, correction right. or pullback in there. And, and it's not moving up, right? And now. it's not moving right. up in equities, but it is moving up relative to equities in right. bonds. Right. So there is more concern or more fear in the bond trade, typically a conservative mm -hmm. uh, uh, position than we're seeing in equities. And then the next slide shows the kind of funkiness that's happening in the bond market, which is the 20-year bond and the 30-year bond. The spread has gone negative. You actually have a higher yield on your 20-year than your 30-year. What do you think is happening yeah, here? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the best explanation here is just a segmented, a segmented market, meaning that there are just different players for different parts uh, or different types of bonds. Uh, my bet it would be that the pensions and the insurance companies are just looking to lock in uh, a, 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 an asset, the treasury, to a liability, some future outlay that they have, and they're not really concerned, and, and they're, they're taking that 30-year rate. I would also uh, consider it likely that uh, there are some hedges and some bets being made on a 30-year treasury, because if the interest rates are very similar, which they are, I know it's slightly below that 30-year, but all of a sudden we get that, sh uh, that sharp movement down in a market where uh, interest rates begin to move down, that 30 year is gonna uh, move uh, on price, price much more than the 20 year. Uh, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't put too much economic explanation. I don't think there's a real big difference between what's happening 20 years from now and 30 years from now in our forecasts and how good would those forecasts be. Everyone struggles with one year out, let alone the yeah. difference between 20 and 30. I think it's far more informative to look at like a two year to 10 year uh, or just how much uh, it, it costs at that FOMC rate, the, the, the Fed window rate versus uh, the, the two year. I think those are, are, more, uh, are better indicators of trouble in the economy than the difference between the 20 and the 30. But it, it's still something right. to note. It mm -hmm. is an odd uh, component uh, to see. Right, and flattening of the yield curve as yeah, well, we, right? We are seeing a flattening of the yield curve. It's not negative, uh, it's not zero, uh, which would be where we'd be very cautionary, uh, looking to put on defensive, but we are seeing 
the, the short end of the curve come up and uh, some movement down on the longer end of the curve, meaning it's flattening. Uh, it means that there is some type of premium for liquidity at the moment. Uh, and if we get to see it negative, I would say we're moving into kind of what we, a lot of people call a liquidity crisis and we'd be defensive. Not there yet, but it is. That is more concerning, I would say, than the difference between the 20 and the 30. Uh, earnings season. We're, we continue to move. Lots of names this week that are reporting. Uh, and uh, um, we, we're now about halfway through. And there have been a couple of ones that yeah. caught our attention for yeah, sure. Yeah, you could probably pull 20 or 30 different ones to show the same example. But everything we've talked about today is happening to most of these earnings reports. You're seeing supply chain issues. Apple thinks they missed out on about $6 billion in sales because they didn't have chips. Um, the top left of the graph is Unilever. They consumer products company. They've raised prices higher than they have in the last nine years. And then in the top right, the example is Amazon. They've had uh, margin problems from shipping. Right. So their operating income has, has come down. So we're seeing that across you know, most of the earnings reports. So all the things that we were talking about on supply chain, we're certainly seeing that mm -hmm. within uh, the microcosm of, of corporations. It's just not the macro data uh, as well. Do you think for Apple that, that basically that's just going to, it's going to show up as sales in the next couple of they, quarters? They think so, yeah. Well, I mean, you wouldn't expect them to say they're lost sales. They're just <laughs> delayed sales. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't see many people, yeah. at least I would... It's so easy to just transfer your, your iPhone to another iPhone. I just, I just got to wait a quarter or something. But as you were saying, we got about half the market, a little over half the market that have reported. The difference between beats uh, on uh, revenue and earnings, really the same from last week. Uh, and, and the week before. And, and maybe there's a sector that hasn't reported much yet, but I would say uh, half the market reporting is, is a good sample to say, you know, earnings season this quarter, it looks good. It's strong. Uh, it's not what it was coming off of the previous lows, but certainly happy with the amount of growth that we're seeing mm -hmm. in earnings and, and the revenue, despite all the other supply chain mm -hmm. disruptions. Beat rates are above the five-year historical. So uh, imagine what it's going to be like yeah. whenever we get these supply chain finally uh, um, moved. So inflation risk is uh, being high. I, I will continue to, to tout this call that we made uh, over a year ago that we were very concerned about inflation. We did not think it was transitory. That's why I think Chris should be at these Fed meetings. We, we have a better record, uh, at least on that call, than the, uh, the Federal Reserve. Continue to favor equities over fixed income. I think that volatility index of the equities versus the volatility index of bonds is showing that there's more concern and more fear in fixed income than there is in equities. Uh, that's not to say that fixed income doesn't provide a ballast in a downturn. Uh, a bear market in bonds is much different than a bear market in the uh, in equities. Favoring the U.S. domestic equity, continue to favor there, uh, and favoring technology, which has actually been helping us here uh, the last couple of weeks. Whenever we look at the uh, uh, the performance, new highs. S and P 500 is is a new high, uh, and it's not just the S and P 500. The Nasdaq 100 also uh, has moved to new highs. That tends to be a pretty big position in our strategies. Yes. Uh, did sell off more than the S&P 500, so it took a couple more days mm -hmm. uh, to regain and, and set those new highs. And one that we haven't seen much of over the last decade, uh, the mm -hmm. Russell 2000, Something is also Something we rarely have exposure to right. is on the on the broad small cap. Yeah, it's we call it the the dash for trash. It's very a, a low quality index. Right. There's a lot of names that you really don't want to own that gets put in there just to hit that 2000 right. number. Um, so it, to see that make new highs uh, it is Could be a kind of euf euphoria. Euphoria. Over, probably it. we're probably late, uh, mid to late cycle in equities. We still think there's some upside, but then fundamentally there's some things that are cautionary and, and, and we want to pay attention to as well. And then kind of uh, building off of that, this is uh, a, probably a confusing graph to, to look at. Uh, I like it though. It's the Dow Jones <laughs> Industrial Average, and what it's saying is. How many days did it take to earn another 1,000 points? So when the Dow was 1,000 back in 1972, to get to 2,000, it took the 5,000 days. Well, that makes sense. It's got to yeah. double. That's going to take a long time. That was a compounded growth rate over that time of 2%. Kind of slow. Uh, now we're down to 34,000, 35,000, and now 36,000. And what's uh, uh, interesting is to go from 32 to 33 it took seven days. And then 33 to 34 took 29 days, 34 to 35, 99 days, and then now it's been 102 days. So 
it's still making them rather quickly compared to whenever it was a thousand, but we're starting to see a slowdown of each a thousand despite the number being bigger. Uh, so it takes less movement uh, in percentage. And all that is telling me is we're slowing a little bit on new highs. Uh, and uh, that's to be expected. At some point, it'll, all of a sudden, it'll start making new highs again and new 1000s rapidly uh, whenever we get into the next bull phase of the market. Uh, any other comments, no, anything just, that we missed? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, the changes in the strategy have been small, right? Just really on the margin, not really too notable. So we've been in the right spot for the last four or five weeks. And yeah. Uh -huh. Things look good. Things look good. Uh, so that will wrap up today's call. If you haven't subscribed, please click down below and subscribe. And if, the, if you know anyone that would also like or enjoy these videos, please click that arrow and share them. Like the, uh, the video if you agree that, that Chris should be with the Fed uh, and, and be on these advisory panels. Uh, and we will see you next week. And, we'll once, and we apologize for the weather canceling the event last Friday, but I do know that Christina and Dan were out uh, and they, they, they really enjoyed being out and seeing our clients uh, at their, their homes instead of having them here in the office. They really enjoyed that and we hope you enjoyed those gifts as well. Uh, thank you and we'll see you next week.